Thank you. Good morning, all. Welcome to this uh, meeting of general scrutiny on the 19th of July 21. My name is Jonathan Lefter, and I'm the chair of the general scrutiny committee, and I'll be chairing this meeting. And before we start, we have the fire and emergency evacuation for those present in the meeting room, not for those joining us via Zoom. In the event of a fire or, or an emergency, the alarm bell will ring continuously. You should vacate the building in an orderly manner through the nearest available exit and make your way to the fire assembly point. Papers uh, and the recording, the, the agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available on the uh, for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council's website. The Council is streaming this meeting live uh, on the Herefordshire Council's YouTube channel and will be making a recording. To ensure that the recording quality is maintained, please speak clearly as possible in, uh, and keep the background noise to a minimum. Please ensure that uh, mobile phones are, and other devices are switched to silent. Others are permitted to film, photograph and record uh, public meeting, providing it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If there are any members of the public who are, who are or become present who do not wish uh, to be filmed or photographed, you will have to raise your hand uh, at the meeting. And any such persons filming or photographing may be made aware. Only committee members present uh, are in the meeting. Uh, meet, only committee members present in the meeting room are able to vote. We have a number of people in attendance uh, as virtual participants, and um, if I can request that they use the raise hand function within the system uh, if they wish to contribute, uh, we'll go through who's present in a moment to ensure that uh, the watching those watching the live stream or recording. Know who you are, can I ask each person to introduce themselves when they are invited to speak during a meeting? Thank you. Right, uh, so we have the committee here, um, but before we do, we're also, it's noted, uh, we are joined by Councillor Chowns. Can I just check that you can hear us and see us? Yes, thanks Chair, I can hear and see you. Excellent. Uh, great to see you. Uh, also, Councillor Jenna Davis. Good morning, Chair and members of scrutiny. I can see and hear you. Excellent. And the leader of the council, Councillor Richard. Yeah, I can hear and see you. Thank you. I was uh, just on mute. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for joining us. And we're also joined by officers. And uh, if I could ask you to introduce yourselves um, as and when the meeting you contribute to the meeting. Um, so we will now go on to apologies for absence. I've received two apologies, one from Councillor Bowes and also um, one from Councillor Durkin uh, who had a decorating accident, so he's now incapacitated for a bit, but uh, is recovering well. Um, so uh, sorry about that, but we expect to see you at the next meeting. So thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have not been able to get any nomination, um, any substitutes for those two absences. So the committee is light and uh, I have to carry on without their wisdom. So I look forward to seeing them at the next meeting. Right, next item on the agenda is declaration of interests. Do any members uh, wish to declare a schedule one, two, or other interest on any agenda item? No, all good. Right, okay. Item four on the agenda uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of June are included and on the agenda. For approval, no matters of accuracy have been received uh, with regard to uh, being notified of monitoring officer. Uh, I move that the uh, minutes are signed to correct records. Do I have everyone in favour? Do I have a, everyone in favour? Yep, okay. 
and against. Right, that's accepted. Thank you. Item five is questions from members of the public. Um, unfortunately, we've had no questions that have been received from members of the public on this occasion. Item six is questions from councillors. Again, we've had no uh, questions submitted uh, from councillors. Chair, can I say this? When, when I was actually trying to click on that, I was getting an error. This is it, said the page was unavailable. And we have had a couple of IT connections with this particular agenda. Can I ask perhaps if officers should have a look at that? Yes. See what caused it? I would like it to happen again. Absolutely. Yes, um, I'm sure uh, that button will be looked into. Thank you. Thanks for raising that there. Okay, so item seven is the um, item uh, to do with assessing the executive responses to the work that the committee has done on two key uh, topics. On the 29th, uh, 26th of April, uh, the committee received an update on the executive responses to the recommendations made in relation to the committee's waste management uh, strategic review a review on the climate and ecological emergency. At the meeting, the committee made seven further recommendations with regard to waste management and 11 further recommendations on the climate and ecological emergency item. Uh, decision notices for the executive responses to these further recommendations were published on Friday, the 16th of July. Uh, the decision and uh, related documents are contained in the agenda. Supplements for the meeting um, so, uh, because Mr. Ben Boswell covers both of these uh, key topics, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite Mr. Boswell uh, to intro introduce the report. Over to you, Mr. Boswell. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so, the first the recovery reports for this one uh, is really just an update on both. Oh, I'm sorry, my third one. Is that better? Yeah. Um, so this one, this report covers both the analysis and as you actually explained on the 16th, both the executive responses were published. Uh, hopefully the links within the document work and take you straight to each of the responses. Um, the cover report itself is really just updating the, the, as you said, the history of the previous response and their subsequent uh, clarifications. So um, do you want me to take you through each of the appendix is probably the best way of doing it? Yes, 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 briefly, that would be very helpful. Uh, do you miss, if I start, maybe the waste management one? Is that the first? Yes, I think if we do the waste management one first, because I, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that Councillor Davis has got to leave by 11 o'clock. So if, if we could just do a brief run through of this, and then if we've got any questions for Councillor Davis, then just make use of her time before 11, if, if that's okay. Brilliant. And then I'll, I'll crack on, but uh, it might be a good opportunity actually to introduce Rachel Joy, who's um, Recently joined the council, I believe Rachel is on the, uh, on the Zoom call. Uh, Rachel, Rachel is our delivery director for Lace, who's joined recently. Um, so if I maybe leave this, if Rachel wants to jump in at any point, please uh, let me know. Good morning, members I'm, uh, of the committee. I'm pleased to be here. I, uh, I'm very much in listening mode, uh, having only arrived five days ago. Uh, but uh, very much looking forward to driving this project forward. Uh, I'd welcome any members wanting individual meetings to brief me, to make contact with me. Uh, and uh, as Ben has done the vast majority of the work on this, Ben will take you through it and I will join or answer any specific questions to me. Thank you very much and uh, a warm welcome to Eric and Council. Over to you, Beth. Brilliant, thank you. So um, the first recommendation on the waste one uh, really was, was noting that the executive uh, really requested the, the link between collection and disposal be welcomed, uh, which, as you can see from the executive responses, is accepted in full. And the commitment there is to undertake a new integrated waste management strategy, which is a piece of work that's been uh, underway. And actually, so the team have recently um, stated that it's going to be, I believe, a decision for the cabinet. Uh, later this month, so they just released very shortly, so we'll be able to see a copy of that. 
I believe there's also been a meeting arranged with the task pitch group to take them through that in advance as well. So, um, so just to say that's been accepted in full and action since. Um, so hopefully, unnecessary questions on that one. Any committee member have any questions at this stage? So, is it task and finish group? I didn't know we had a task and finish group yet. Yes, there was a task and finish group appointed uh, January 2020, I think it was. Well, we're electing the chair today. No, no, this is, this, is, this, this is that that's the litter. This is about the waste management that okay. we did a year ago. Okay, so has anyone from that uh, waste manager here, or will they? When anybody be sitting perhaps on the task and finish group for the litter? Because I think they, they connect in a lot of ways. I'm just concerned that we've done something and then we're going to have another task and finish on litter, which is uh, it's not the same, I know, but it still has to do with getting rid of garbage. And uh, I think we need to have something connected here somehow. Thank you. Ben, you have a recommendation? Yeah, thanks, Ken. So I guess I was, uh, just to I suppose, clarify on, on the two of so the first review was really around uh, the collection and disposal contracts coming up to an end and the opportunity to cancel. Yeah. Uh, so that, that really a strategic view on how we're managing waste. Um, and as I said, the new strategy will be available for, for viewer comment very, very shortly. Um, recognise there are obviously clear links with litter to waste because obviously a much bigger popular litter as well because we have the street lines. Uh, yeah, that's my concerns is that we, you know, garbage pickup, etc. with litter pickers, they have yeah, garbage to be picked up. And that needs to be considered when we're doing a waste management program because I think right now it's not always being picked up on time. There's no way, there's no way of knowing except if you go on Facebook and check where, where the bags are. So I think we need to be connected to them. And at the moment we're not. Anyway, it's just a, a concern that I have that we have a task, task, Group here, task and finish group for waste management and task and finish group are looking at for, for litter, which they blend in together. I think we need to somehow bring them together. Thanks. I think on that point, Councillor Summers, I think that's a really important point for the task and finish on litter mm -hmm. to pick up and be conscious of so feed in it if and when appropriate to how they deal with their work and how it fits in with the overall strategy. So uh, I think that's work for the task and finish group to get their heads around. Okay. Um, um, well, just before I move on, I suppose one of the key aspects of the task and finish group report and the emerging waste strategy, I mean, it's all around education behaviour change. Right? There's a lot, a lot of that within it, and that was recognised by the previous group. And um, having seen the post go, you know, the, the litter that can be carried forward in there. And so the work of team that we're going forward will be looking at the waste hierarchy trying to reduce waste in the first instance and then making sure we're moving that hierarchy to process it or see it out of the, the chain. Chair, if you don't mind, I have a couple of questions from uh, Tracy Bowles. If you can read them out. That's a thing. Is, is, is that about the waste management strategy? Yes, yeah, it's uh, you seem to have different object, objectives from most of your county council, is what you're saying. In terms of our waste strategy, in light of our climate and ecological emergency, should we not consider moving forward without them doing what is best for residents of America? I'm not sure if that fits in with you, Ben. It's a question that's being asked by Tracy Bowles. And the other one is when will the waste comes off to start and what are their objectives? Will they be working with the litter for the future? That's two questions. Yes, yeah. okay. Well, we can pick up yeah. whenever you want, Ben. It's just something I'd throw in there. But yeah, you yeah. know, pick them up now. Yeah, probably easier to pick Yeah, so okay, go ahead, please. One around what, what is the council doing? So, so we've just been working on a new strategy that has been proposed to cabinet later this month. So that, that discussion will say, you know, sense in future direction approach waste and targets and policies within that. So it would be that, that needs to come first, and that's, that's coming forward later this month. Uh, and again, there's a task for the people on that duty to go through that in advance as well. Um, your second point around the waste comms officer. Um, the waste comms officer has been appointed recently, so we're just waiting for a start date on that new, new person. Thanks, Ben. Okay, also, we uh, 
Councillor Davis, who wants to uh, come in at this stage? Yeah, thank you. Um, just t two things. Firstly, um, for anybody listening at home or anybody on in the who's not in the room, we cannot hear anything other than what Councillor Lester is saying. I'm not sure if you'll position yourselves to talk to Councillor Lester, but I think you need to talk into the microphone because honestly, I, I, I can't hear. I've got nods from other people saying that they can't hear either. Um, I just about picked up what Councillor Summers had said with regards to the questions and thank you Councillor Lester for repeating them. Um, nothing much to add too much to it other than to say this is entirely why Rachel has been recruited. Um, she has to look at the overall picture and determine whether or not it is viable to stay with Worcestershire or whether it isn't or whether we do a hybrid. There's every single option is, with, is on the table and that's exactly why we've got Rachel in um, who's got leading expertise in this particular area. So thank you for the question, Councillor Bowes, and absolutely it'll be, it will be part of that. And I just wanted to go back on... Councillor Summers' point, you're absolutely right, Councillor Summers, about making the link between the litter task and finish and the waste task and finish group. That's exactly why I've asked for it to happen now, so that it can feed into our overall um, waste, what we do with waste going forward, because it is absolutely essential, um, especially the parts around education. So thank you. I'll make sure that there is a direct link between those two. Thank you, Councillor Davis. That's very uh, helpful, and thank you for your scrutiny of the uh, microphones. That uh, that was really helpful too. Uh, really helpful feedback. So yes, if we can all get close to our microphones, if we're in the room, that would be helpful. Right. Okay, I can go back to bed. Thank you. I'm just testing that working better. Try it again, Ben. Is that is that better, Councillor Davis? A little bit. Not particularly. Yeah, yeah, that's very into the room, but, um, okay, I'll, I'll go a bit closer. I'm just trying not to eat the mic. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, recommendation B, uh, again, really is, is very much the same as recommendation A. It was our proposal to develop a new unified waste strategy. Uh, as I said, that is something that has been uh, accepted and actually since and will come forward later this month. Are you happy for me to move on to recommendation C? So, oh, can I just give Ben? Can I give? Can I just give Ben a tip on using the microphone? You're speaking that way, so get your microphone round in front of you because you'll look the mic's open. And also, when you're using a microphone, it doesn't mean you still don't need to pro pronounce and, and push or project your voice out of it. And microphone can't do everything. Thank you for that. Well, we're learning quite a lot today about the um, microphone techniques. Um, back to bed. Thank you, Councillor Wilding. Hopefully that sounds a bit better. Um, so, so recommendation C uh, was really a request that there be greater clarity of what happens to recycled waste within the county. And again, this, this has been accepted within the response. Um, and what we've done is to make sure that the important information that is available is on the council website um, and also you know, more through the campaigning and working with our external content communication to help educate us to what's happening with waste and uh, collected through contract. Can I, can I just say at that point, what, there have been various uh, documents produced recently about investigations into what does happen to recycled waste. And just because it's been given to a company who's saying we're going to recycle it, unless we know the destination of that product, and especially if it's going internationally into different places, we might not know exactly what happens to it. And there are some horror stories about waste being, what we think is going to be recycled, ends up not being recycled at all, and ends up being burned by the roadside or some horrific thing like that. So I think one of the really important and responsible things to do would be to get greater clarity about if somebody says or a company says that the product is going to be recycled, we actually know exactly how and where it's going to be recycled. And if we aren't able to get that information, then that really does, in my mind, raise queries about the claims that we really truly are recycling. So I, I think that's the level at which I would like us to be greater, have greater clarity on what happens to plastic that goes overseas somewhere 
how does it get recycled and where and when, that type of thing. Uh, thanks. Chair, Chair can, I come, can I come in on that point so, to try and be helpful? I think, I think there are two conversations. There, there's a point that you've just made, which would be picked up through the monitoring of the contract uh, and through the contract monitoring arrangements. But there's a second conversation about what happens to waste when you get it right in terms of your disposal and what happens to waste when you get it wrong in terms of putting things in the wrong bins. So I think, I think there are several communications messages that we can pull out of this. If we're going to get residents recycling more, a key message is, has to be about getting it in the right place. And yes, certainly, uh, Ben will pick up through the contract monitoring arrangements uh, what happens to it. Uh, fortunately, fewer and fewer countries like China are accepting uh, inappropriate waste, uh, but it still does leak into inappropriate places. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. That's helpful. Um, yeah, so do you want to move on to that one? Yeah. Uh, so recommendation D is actually very similar to recommendation C in that this is referring to all waste in the county's environment or something. Um, this one, because it's slightly different worded, is partially accepted. The reason for that is that whilst the council is responsible for municipal waste and processes that, and, and we will be able to have better information and clarity on that, uh, we're not responsible for all waste in the county that's processed through other businesses. Either. So uh, just because of the way the recommendation is worded, we're not able to do that for all waste because the lot is out of our control. However, all the waste that is collected will be addressed in their response. Ben, can I just ask for clarity? A lot of the waste, the black bin waste, goes to the energy from waste plants and it's incinerated, turned into energy. It seems to be a great use of waste that just cannot be reused. But there is a residual amount that doesn't go there. Um, why is that? And if we're going to look at contracts, can we avoid that scenario? Can uh, so you say yes, sir? Somewhere between 10 and 20% of the waste, the, the black bin waste that doesn't go to the energy from waste goes to the landfill at present. That's due to the, the term the contract we already have with Mr. Um, Share and our current provider. Um, absolutely. Um, getting commitments, I think, very much part of the task of British group, asking for um, sort of 1%, um, I think it was 1% higher than the initial task of British recommendations. So as you'll see through the emerging strategy, that is very much at the core of the thinking of the new strategy. Excellent. Right. Um, any questions from the committee at this stage? Councillor okay. Summers. Uh, maybe ahead of myself here, but I'm still concerned about recycling. And with so much stuff that can't be recycled still, uh, and that I don't think we have a definitive anything definitive to tell people what they can, we have it, but I don't think we're modeling it that much or there's not too much comms on it, but I think we need to come up with something that tells people simply what they can and what they can't and what they have to do. Because we have it in literature, but we don't have it on the bin or anything like that. And I think we need it on the bin because that's the first source of contact. And we're still, have, I've been looking at this for a couple of years and we're still not looking at it. But people need to very quickly look at their bin and say, oh, I can't put that in there, or I can't put that in there. It's a simple process, putting these things in, and I can't see why we're taking so long with it. Thanks. Do you have any answers on that one? I appreciate it. Actually, Ben, that, that's a suggestion that I haven't heard before. They do it in France. I do know that. They actually put on the bin itself a, a sticker which tells you what you should and should be putting in that bin. Is that something that's been explored? Um, I find that quite surprising, man, because I brought this up now at least two or three times, probably more over the last four years. So I think we, you know, actually it just gets hit locked down and nothing happens with it, or somebody says it doesn't work or it's too expensive or something, but or we already do that with, with the flyers, but that's not good enough. We need something right at the source to get it to get it fixed. Anyway, that's just my feeling. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Summers. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I think Councillor Davis wants to uh, come in at this point. 
Yes, thank you. Um, just to go back on Councillor Summers there, absolutely that's part of the comm strategy regarding um, putting putting labels on bins, putting any any type of media out that makes sure that people understand at that point when they're putting it in a bin. I had in my first meeting with Rachel last week and one of the things that stuck in my head was that actually the decisions regarding your waste begin in the kitchen. So I think we need to go back even further than that. And when people are cooking, how are we making sure that they're buying the right products that haven't got the waste around it, ensuring that they know at that point that if they've got a plastic film, we can do very little with it. So it's things like that. So I think it's even further back that we need to go with regards to the next couple of years and our communications to educate people, including myself, um, on when those decisions are made. So they're made in the supermarket, they're made in the kitchen. And then at the last point, you're when you're putting things in the bin, that's when you recognise that what can and can't go in there. So absolutely, it will be taken on board, Councillor Summers. Um, and Councillor Summers, you're absolutely right. You've raised it with me on a numerous occasions. So it is, it, I promise you, it's being taken on board. Excellent. Um, so hopefully you don't have to recycle the point again. Um, uh, good one. Yeah, uh, Councillor Wiley. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add a, a little bit to that. Uh, one of the problems, I'm not sure how great a problem this is, but putting stuff in the recycling bin that's contaminated with some other product. Uh, a perfect example is a cardboard box that's been wrapped with a lot of plastic tape. Um, and I was wondering, does anyone know, does that make the cardboard box unable to be recycled? Does it pollute it? And so therefore, do cons need to suggest to people that they strip off the, the plastic before they put cardboard into the you know, recycling? Thanks. I guess on that, it would depend on just how much it's on there. It's specifically about buying it, yes, absolutely. Uh, if you've got a little bit, then that would be fine to put straight through. But again, that's something we can pick up as part of the work comms campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have a new waste comms officer starting very shortly. We have been very committed to doing a lot more on the comms and education. And say it's working very much behind the waste hierarchy. And as Kansas said, it says it's about getting out of the waste stream altogether. So that's something we can pick up and support. I think it's a an excellent point because you know th there's a lot of plastic containers that have food residue in them. And it would be helpful for members of the public to know if the, the plastic container has to be properly cleaned in your kitchen before you then put it in the recycling, or does it matter? You just put it in the recycling. So greater clarity in, about the condition, as Councillor Wilding uh, quite rightly says, hundreds of cardboard boxes come with masking tape on them, thick tape, especially when lots of uh, products are now being uh, sent home, um, posted to you home. So it's the, you know, to what extent is that packaging able to be recycled if it is contaminated to that extent? So I think greater clarity on that would be really helpful to householders. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll address that as part of the uh, comments, take that forward, absolutely. Um, the next recommendation within the report was around um, undertaking options appraisal for waste that's likely to be a nuisance, uh, either through smell or other hazards. So, again, that's a piece of work that we're undertaking at the moment. The team are doing it to research, looking at options as to how we can take that forward to accept it in full. The next recommendation then is recommendation G, which is around encouraging the opportunity for uh, public to use the use of the HRCs as the household recycling centres um, and elsewhere uh, via the website. So again, that's been accepted in part, and that's very much part of the council's new integrated waste strategy, very much looking at encouraging reuse as a way like getting things out of the waste stream altogether. Um, we've already introduced the reuse container of the bulky wastes, which is something that's been new as a result of the review, and we'll continue to address that through the future uh, promotions and the contracts. Um, can, yeah. can I ask? Uh, Councillor Davis, while, while you're here, does that include a facility at the tip where somebody's just used bike can be set aside and if somebody's coming to the tip and needs a bike for their young child can just help themselves to it? Is that, is, because I think the, the, the last time we talked about this, it was recycled 
items to go to charities and whatnot, but not necessarily curbside collection at the tip. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the other thing that when we were speaking to Rachel last week, it's about working with community groups and looking at whether or not under um, in our recycling centres, whether we could have exactly what you talked about in the last meeting, Councillor Lester, which was around, can we have spaces where things could be put aside for members of the public to take? Now, presently, that that can't happen under our current contract because of waste tonnage, etc., and who owns the waste once it crosses the... The boundary of the site but actually moving forward that's where Rachel talks about putting things inside the contract and managing it so that we enable people to be doing exactly what you've said so yeah that will be that will be taken forward into the next couple of years and into the contract. Okay thank you for the clarification I appreciate that. Um, Councillor Butler. Thank you Mr Chairman. Uh, when I lived in Hampshire they had that was some time ago now they had a very thriving reuse part of their recycling centers, and uh, that seemed to be very popular and very effective. So a lot of stuff that was one person's rubbish became another person's treasure. And uh, I don't think it was uh, in any way detrimental to, to this whole system in any way. Uh, we do have to, in quite rightly, we've got to go back to suppliers, shops, supermarkets, uh, to make sure that um, our products are both safe and fit for us to use, but as minimally packaged as humanly possible, I think. It's not always easy. It sounds very simple, but apparently uh, health and safety sometimes dictates things that are contrary to what seems sensible to the ordinary person. Perhaps Glenn, you might know more about that than I do. And we're talking about, you're talking about, I think it was Professor uh, Wilding talking about the, making sure that whatever went into recycling was clean. And certainly in Australia, and over a very long time now, people have been always trained to be meticulous in cleaning whatever they do, whatever they use, uh, before they put it into the recycling. It's a question of education, really, and it may take a bit of time, but it is very important. You don't just shove your, your plastic container full of bits of food, waste, or whatever in it. You, you clean it all out of your tins, you do the same. It is possibly ponderous initially, but once you have used to it, it's, it's worked well. I would also counsel that simplicity is a great thing. And pictures very often uh, worth a thousand words. I know it's an old adage, but it does work. And if you're going to put things on the bins, you can put a picture on the bin of what goes in there, uh, rather than just writing it. I don't know if that would be a good thing. Uh, as far as the household waste centers go, uh, I know we've been running a, a, an appointment program there, but I, I feel it can be rather inflexible because both of my residents say, well, we, we turned up just in case and there was no one there at all, and yet we were turned away. We were going to go away and come back with an appointment. Well, I said, well, look, you're, you're idle, there's nothing happening, go in there, it takes us two minutes, why can't we do it? Can we please think about a bit more flexibility of use? Thank you. Um, uh, before we get to uh, Ben, Councillor Davis, did you, did you want to, uh, I know you and I have discussed this quite a few times, but uh, Councillor Bowen, I assure you I didn't prompt him in uh, raising that query. One of the things that I was just um, thinking about with that point, and I think what's really been that, advantageous about the booking system is that you you haven't had out of county people coming and so that has reduced the, the waste um, there and so that is a net positive uh, outcome of the booking system and I'm happy to acknowledge that and you know I think that's a really good thing but is there a way of simplifying the booking system so that when you turn up you can just state your name and address and then therefore you don't have to have the booking system but you can show that you're actually a resident of Herefordshire, and then therefore you have the flexibility that Councillor Bowen has just has just uh, you know requested. And given apps and technology, it can't be beyond the wit of the council to come up with some system like that. So I just put that to you uh, in, in view of Councillor Bowen's suggestion. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, thanks for that, Councillor Lester. Um, yeah, I think that's a really 
good point that Councillor Bowen made, was, which is around flexibility. If it's empty and there's slots, why aren't, why aren't we allowing that? And I did see the article that was in the paper around it. Um, so I've already come away and thought, right, what can we do about that? So it may be that we retain the booking system but with that degree of flexibility if somebody turns up. The issue is if somebody turns up and there isn't that availability for them, the likelihood is that you, you will end up with people possibly fly tipping or doing other matters to get rid of that waste. So it's about that delicate balance between the two. I absolutely completely agree about the booking system and its inflexibility. Unfortunately, due to the contract, it's Worcestershire that control the booking system. So if you, a, a really important thing here is if you can't turn up, and I've had it before, I've been unable to turn up because I was self-isolating. I couldn't, I couldn't cancel that appointment. So there was an appointment there that was waiting that somebody else could have had and they didn't do it. So I think that that's the, that's the fundamental flaw. So I'll be chatting with Rachel around this and what we could possibly do around that booking system. Um, I think it does have its huge benefits. Um, I think we need to look at the hours, the times, the availability of those particular sites um, to make sure that we're using them at the right time. I know it's very easy for people to get slots ac in, across the county other than Hereford Recycling Centre. So we need to look at why is that and look for those behaviours and what we could do to, to enable more people to do more things um, with, with, certainly with reuse. I was in a, I was in a, in, I was at the Lempster Recycling Centre the other day and somebody was throwing away a perfectly good bed and I nearly cried and I thought, well, you know, that that's something that we could have put through reuse. So I think it's that whole educational piece again. What don't, what don't What is the very final point that you actually take something to a recycling centre? So I think it's that whole journey for me, but I think the booking system absolutely needs looking at um i'm not saying i'm get it's going to be got rid of councillor lester before you get excited um but it's about what we can do with the with the cup within our current means and, uh, th thank you for that and uh, as i say uh, you know the fact that it doesn't uh, have uh, people coming from out of the county means that uh, it's reduced the cost um so i see the virtue of it there but it's just it's just ensuring that that booking system is flexible enough, I think. So uh, really appreciate the fact that that could be looked at further. Um, but we've got Councillor Stark and then Councillor Wardy. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've left my comment until the end because I wanted to hear what everyone else had to say. Um, the unified waste strategy needs to put the resident at the heart of it. I mean, I do hear everyone going on about, on about washing everything up, separating everything, doing the best you can, and some of us actually do do that. But the poor resident is left with the burden of having to deal with all these different materials that cross their threshold every day, unless they choose not to buy the products. So I really think we do need to shift the strategy to how do we help residents to meet the, uh, the requirements that we want to place in them in terms of reuse, recycle, repair, and everything else. I don't think we've done that up to now. I really don't think we've looked at that in that respect. We've looked at it as a service that we provide with a course and maybe certain outcomes, but we haven't looked at the challenges that residents face. Now, I know some residents will always be difficult to bring on board, but even those residents that want to comply with our strategy, if they get a Pringle tube, for example, you should be recycling that because the materials in the Pringle tube are different. They cannot be recycled together. That's just one example. And I just feel that when we're taking this opportunity to look at the strategy, please put the resident at the heart of it and let's try and help them to deliver what we want to deliver. Thank you. It's had another form, crisps are available. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and also I, I agree, Mr. Chairman, that simplicity is absolute key to this. Do not confuse the wretched citizen who is burdened enough all sorts of instructions and admonitions at the moment. So let's keep it absolutely simple and easy to use. Okay. Can, can I invite uh, comments from, from officers about that, that, that point about making it, uh, putting the, uh, the residents at the heart of the strategy? Can, can I come in on that point? Absolutely, absolutely Rachel. Please I, do I, so. I think there are a number of things that will probably be helpful to residents here. Firstly, 
Herefordshire is part of a nation. There's a national strategy. Uh, and there are a couple of elements, I think, that are important to that. Firstly, there is the national work level with the supermarkets, with, uh, with industry on standardising a lot of products, uh, getting the packaging right at that level, which would be helpful to residents in terms of uh, making, making it absolutely clear what can be recycled and reducing unnecessary packaging. The second part of that strategy is moving to a common set of collection across the nation. Uh, so if you look on the RAP website at the moment, some of the stuff it says because it's ger generic and national is contradictory to some of the stuff which is specific to Herefordshire, which is local. And we need to eliminate that because there are, you know, as members have pointed out, it's incredibly confusing. Uh, so to simplify it, I think we have got to anchor what we do within that national strategy, uh, particularly those key areas, and then really get down, down to focusing with residents on what are the two, th two or three things that we want you to do now, uh, before all of that comes along and the new collection systems come along. Uh, and I'm going to be working closely with Ben and his officers on identifying that. We think it'll be around uh, contamination. So sluicing it out, sprucing it up could be a simple message about that. Uh, and we will feed that into the comms work that we're doing. So I think if we anchor what we're doing in what's happening nationally and apply that locally, uh, then that will get it as simple. But residents are gonna have to do a lot to educate themselves on what is a complex area. Okay, um, Councillor, thank you for that response. Councillor Wiley. I'm just going to bring in uh, something which is uh, which I experienced personally. I run a self catering holiday home, and um, the waste that comes from the people that stay at the home, the household waste, uh, the council insists that we buy plastic sacks and put that waste. Uh, classify it as trade waste and put that waste in a plastic sack next to the bin uh, for it to be collected. And the waste is identical to the waste that we produce at home. And it's all been cut down. I'm struggling to think what we do throw away in household waste now, but I guess an example is a bit of clean plasticky film stuff that has to be stripped off the top of the package. So it's stuff like that which can't be recycled. Um, so we uh, the council insists that we buy plastic sacks to put that stuff in, when in fact our personal bin is nearly always less than half full. And we can put it in there and it would save the plastic sacks. Um, we're quite happy to pay the council to take it away. Uh, currently, it costs about £87 uh, for 50 sacks, which lasts basically a year, one a, more or less one a week. Um, we happily pay the £87 or even £100, uh, but why do the council insist that we have to put it in plastic sacks? It's just increasing the plastic. Thanks. And also, presumably, there's some waste in there that could be recycled, but because it's trade waste, it can't be. Um, no, we're talking about actual tr t total waste uh, that can't be recycled. We also have recycling. As, as another side of it. This is just waste, uh, household waste that can't be recycled. Ben, could you come back on that one, please? Yeah, so um, thanks for bringing uh, just that kind of well, I think, I think um, there's the fundamental issue there is, I suppose, if, if it's a, a holiday let that has people in there, obviously it might be very similar to household waste, it is technically classed as, as commercial waste. And um, the council, through the council tax, only collects the money to pay for the domestic waste. And with that being commercial waste, it would otherwise be subsidised by the council if it was just collected without a different service. Um, so the reason it has to be segregated is so it can be collected separately and the you know, duty of care forms that would have been sorted out with that as well, which is the requirement of, of the business that it was doing that. So it, it's not as simple as I appreciate that this sort of it would remove the need for the bag, but we do need to collect and process the waste differently. Again, it is going down to duty of care with the waste collection board business and, and the different mechanism behind that. Um, I'm very well, very happy to go and speak to the team, see if there's anything we can 
consider that might be able to reduce the amount of plastic you might use there. But it, but we do have to do it differently and legally, and that, that's fundamentally why that, that is the approach. Can I just come back on that then? It sounds from that answer that basically what you're saying is it has to be done that way because that's the way it has to be done. And I don't, I don't really see why. Um, because, you know, we are very careful over what we put in our waste, and we're also quite careful over who, uh, what the guests put in their waste. Uh, we check it as it goes in the bin. So I, I can't see why there couldn't be some scheme introduced, maybe only for small holiday lets, but let's face it, there are a lot of them in Herefordshire, so presumably they're all having to do this. Uh, the, the care leafleting, yes, you do get that, um, and you pay for that privilege, and that's good. We want to pay, but we don't want to create more plastic. I think also uh, we have to be careful saying that because that holiday let doesn't pay council tax, it has to come out of business rates or like that. I think that's quite a dangerous argument because 50% of the business rates comes back to the council that helps to run the council as a whole. So I think if you're worried about budgets, it doesn't, when in the great scheme of things, government funding isn't really the issue here. It's, it's just having a common sense approach to dealing with household waste that's generated in another form. Uh, I think it would be helpful if that matter was looked into more, uh, because all Councillor Wilding is really saying is we're generating more plastic bags for the sake of collecting the same amount of waste. And it, it goes in the same truck that comes round. Yeah. It's yeah. collected on the same day at the same time, put in the same truck. So it, it's not being collected separately. Okay. Yeah, okay, right. We've got Councillor Bowen, then Councillor Davis wants to come in, and then we've got Councillor Stark. So, Councillor Bowen first, and then we'll go to Councillor Davis. This sounds a bit like telling the Premier Minister a uh, bureaucratic, can we say, uh, bureaucracy determined to make things difficult for people, and surely a little reclassification from the bureaucrats might make things very much easier for people like Councillor Wilding and his little businesses. And I know that Herefordshire is full of little businesses like this, and it's part of our stock in trade. And what's, what keeps Herefordshire going? So can we make it easier for them to think, please? Thank you. Okay, well, we've got Councillor Davis. We're still benefiting from the fact that she's still in the meeting. Uh, so over to Councillor Davis. Yeah, I'll be leaving at 11.20, so apologies. I, I, I do actually have to go to my normal job. Um, so yeah, absolutely, Councillor Wardin, 100%. We shouldn't be using plastic bags to get that waste, so we will take that back and it will form part of what we're gonna do moving forward. That seems like a quick win that we should be looking at, uh, especially when it's going into the same truck. So if I can ask mm -hmm. Rachel, could we have a, um, a look at that to see if something can be done relatively quickly, thank you. Appreciate that uh, feedback. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Uh, Councillor Stark. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It, it's back to putting the resident, in this case, the small business at the heart of the strategy. We really do need to look at our processes, and make sure that we're facilitating the resident and the small business to comply with what we want them to comply with. And that is my concern here, that when you look at this strategy, you must encompass everything in it, including the rules and regulations that we might be setting down. And if there are national rules and regulations, then let's write to, to the ministers and challenge them and say, this is not helping us in Herefordshire to do what we might want to do nationally as well. So that's my concern, facilitation for the resident, for the small business, and don't let's put all the burden on them in order to deliver what we want to deliver in terms of our waste strategy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Can I just pause for a moment just to check? Because obviously we're responding to the executive response, um, but we're also putting forward our recommendations and uh, Councillor Davis has been kind enough to acknowledge that there's things that she needs to look into. But I feel more comfortable if we had resolutions or points that we've made and agreed that this is what we want uh, to add on to the work we've already done. So can I check with Ben if we 
captured those points as we've been, we've, uh, as we've been going along? Uh, yes, Chair, I mean, principally it's been around communications, uh, the booking system, and uh, the issue of uh, waste from coal at this point. Okay, so we will we'll be having our recommendations. Um, we've gone through all of the points with regards to the waste strategy. Is there anything else that committee members would like to uh, raise at this juncture? Um, Councillor Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just uh, surprised that we're still sending uh, so much to landfill. I was under the impression that very, very little went to landfill now, and that everything that couldn't be recycled went to the waste to power centre. Can you please illuminate me or illuminate the whole problem? I shall read Yes, yes, of light. Well, yes, yes, yes. So, um, I mean, as I mentioned before, the current contract we've got, which is part of the 25 year contract, uh, which is coming to examine and gives the ability for the contractor to put up to 20% of the waste through the at the moment. And really, it's due to the commercial benefit of doing that, which the contract allows. We're not in a position to be able to change that at the moment, but what we are looking at very strongly. I think we'll see that as very much part of what it does to the deep sea. And the new strategy going forward is that it's actually getting that absolutely minimizing anything that goes around the point of the that sets that in stone for any future commissioning. But as I said, this is part of a very, very long term contract, 25 year one that we're coming to the end of. So unfortunately, that does still have the mechanism there for the contract to do that. But we are the that we don't have that going forward. So that, that is that is why. I'm surprised to hear that that was part of the contract because we were told different things at various times in the last 25 years. And I've been around for quite a long time. And I remember this the contract being initiated. And of course, that's got before the waste of power station. And I thought we could have had some flexibility within the contract that well, the whole object of having that waste of power station was to absolutely get rid of land to as far as possible. And make sure we use all all the stuff we couldn't recycle to at least generate electricity. I'm, I'm still very surprised that this is going on. Well, it, it's just highlighted there, Councillor Bow, that when the new contract comes up, that's one of the key objectives, and that's been uh, raised and echoed and uh, supported. Uh, I believe Councillor Jones would like to come in at this stage. Thank, thanks, Chair. It's um, it's actually just that um, Ben Boswell, I'm afraid I'm also finding it really hard to hear your mic. Your mic seems to be the worst in the room by far. And I've, I've just heard from somebody who's watching the YouTube stream who's finding it really difficult to hear the room as well. So yeah, maybe a new mic would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Chance. Appreciate it. And uh, got a new mic standing by. Right, okay. Thank you, Chair. One thing I want to throw in, and I haven't heard any mention about it, is contaminated waste. Um, in the past, it's been put all over the place. They're like, I know the tunnel between Old Lacey and, and Hereford is full of contaminated waste that was taken from only sawmills. Uh, I have no proof of that, but that's what I understand, and I, I'm pretty sure it's true. So. What's in place for contaminated waste? Um, it's a, it is almost a separate thing, I know, but it is an issue because there's more and more contaminated waste as we move forward. Especially when we always do things that bother us with, with uh, the exit, you know, the old army and the old barracks and everything that goes there, and the shell store, etc. I don't know what happens to that contaminated waste, which it would have been. So, is there anything in, in doing that takes contaminated waste into consideration? Thanks. Uh, just checking the mic first. Is this for any best against the change? Can I say this? Is that the same? It's we have a bit of feedback from those joining us via Zoom. The microphone's in the middle of the room there as well. If you don't mind, that might improve it slightly. Okay, well, hopefully, hopefully this one is better. Um, this has us on, on, on the waste, you can have the waste you refer to then. So that was specifically for projects in capital buildings so that one less. Because uh, each of those would be, I suppose, a commercial waste, so that wouldn't be a waste stream that come through the council's domestic stream. So the waste contracts and, and council responsibilities are we, we run the domestic waste service for the recycling, household recycling centres, 
um, we all break the commercial waste service, which is the one that Councillor Alden was referring to, that the holiday lets use. Um, but contaminated waste, such as construction waste, wouldn't come through any of our waste contracts. That would be done through a private contract separately outside of the council. So, do we have anyone in council that is in charge of that? It seems to be uh, quite a consideration. I know there's uh, one of them. Dined there was a place where they used to used to do a lot of paint and stuff. And that's all vanished all of a sudden. But if we have contaminated waste in, in the county, we need to know what's happening with it. Um, and I'm back to the example of the of the almost sawmills waste, which was put in the in the railway tunnel. Um, you know, that was done, I know, a long time ago, maybe 30, 40 years, but you know, not too many people seem to know about it. It's been authorized by someone in council at the time, I guess, and that has just vanished. So we need to be keeping a little closer tabs on that stuff. It's still commercial waste, whether we, you know, and it really needs to be considered. Uh, and let, I know there's cleaning that can be done too, et cetera, but we need to make sure that that's being done. And I know it's commercial, but it still affects the residents. Thank you. Chair, uh, can I come in on that? Uh, Councillor, you're, you're making an important point. Nobody should be transferring waste without actually having a waste transfer license and a waste disposal license. Uh, if you have recent examples of waste, contaminated or hazardous waste being dumped, then that's something that needs to be brought to the attention of public protection colleagues so that they can investigate that and take appropriate uh, supportive or enforcement action as is necessary. Well, what happens with waste that was got rid of 40 years ago? I it's, don't, it's, I, I, I don't know. Can we do any? Can we have that waste checked now to see if it's if it's cleaner than it was? It's sitting in a tunnel that's could be used. As, I don't know. It's just one of those things that it's it may not fit in here, but it's still a, a problem that we've got. Anyway, thanks. So I think Councillor Summers, if there's a pollution problem that's existing is investigating yeah. by officers um, but the general point about commercial waste it needs to be dealt with uh, and those developing a site or whatever they have to employ professional people to get rid of their waste for them and do it responsibly so there's, there's two different issues there I think but if you are aware of a contaminated land issue I think perhaps we should um, see, see about reporting that uh, outside of the meeting. Um, Councillor Davis, did you want to come back in? Sorry. Yeah, it was just to go back to, there was a conversation around the amount of waste that goes to landfill. I personally don't think that we as a council have been saying it enough to our residents about the fact that within our contract that we have a figure there that I think people would be really quite shocked by. So in... It, this is in our waste strategy that will be coming forward and it's important to know I've got a meeting tomorrow with the waste task and finish group to go through the strategy with them this waste task and finish group is coming along the journey with us um so they they've got a briefing separately on the on the waste strategy before it comes to cabinet but as a really good example here to say about the amount of waste going to landfill over the last two years it's almost increased to 22% of that waste has gone to landfill. That is huge. So one of, our, one of our strategic targets coming forward within the waste strategy says no more than 1% of, muni of municipal waste to be sent to landfill from 2025 and zero waste to landfill by 2035. Those are the targets that I think the public expect us to have. And those are the targets that we should be aiming for. And I absolutely don't doubt that as a council moving forward, we will hit those targets. So um, just to make it very clear, we've been in a really bad place with sending things to landfill. I don't think that the public are aware of that, um, but they are now. And I've just told you what the figures are. Um, it's nothing to be hidden. It's in the waste strategy. It makes it very clear that isn't acceptable, but that's within the joint contract at the moment. So that's the difference. 22%, we're going right down to 1%. So I hope that we'll have support from members on that. I'm sure you will. Um, Councillor Stark. Um, Councillor Davis, I wonder if that's a lesson in terms of the length of the contract we should give out this time. Uh, we are giving out a 25 to 30 year contract. 
things can change so much in that time. And if the contract is rigidly set and there's no review points in it, then we can be left with a policy which is totally out of date because the contract doesn't allow us any flexibility. So I think that's a real lesson for us when it comes to the contract negotiations and this new uh, waste strategy. I couldn't agree more, Councillor Stark. I really couldn't agree more. Because of the nature of the contracts, they tend to be longer because they're such a huge financial, um, there's such a high financial burden to them. However, there are things that we can easily put inside a contract that allows us to review, allows break clauses, allow, there's so much within the remit of a contract that we could be utilising. So that's absolutely what we need to be doing. I, it, beyond me on why we'd give a contract that long that it's got so much inflexibility within it. And that for me is the key on why we've been unable to achieve some really ambitious um, statements that we've previously said. It, it's all based upon what's inside that contract. A really simple example, when we were allowing bookings, there was nothing within the within the contract that allowed people on bikes to bring their waste. Well, of course, as a council, we want people to use bikes. We want people to not to use their cars less to create less emissions. But we didn't have it, the availability within the contract for people to actually rock up on a bike. It took a couple of months, two to three months to be able to get that through. It's madness. So we need to allow that flexibility within any contract, no matter how we deliver that contract, it needs to be in there. I would say that as a wider point for all of the council contracts, to be honest. Thanks, uh, Councillor Bowen. Yes, I, I totally understand all, all your comments about contracts. I remember this was written quite a long time ago, and, and many things have changed quite radically since the contract was put in place. And I hope we will learn from our experiences over the last 25 years how we can make a really good contract, which gives the people the length of time to, for their financial systems to work. And that is important to commercial level. Um, and also gives us the chance to, to have the break clauses and the chance for revision when necessary that will actually when that has changed quite radically, we can actually change our contract to, to suit that without actually destroying the commercial viability of the contract. And I'm really sorry, Chair, I have to go. Um, really, really sorry. I'll leave you in the capable hands of Rachel and Ben. And I'm sure if there's anything from the environment perspective, Councillor Challenge will be able to step in as well. So thank you all for your time this morning and allowing me to come along and speak and look forward to working with you all in the future. Okay, thank, thank you for your contributions, Councillor Davis. Have a good rest of your day. Um, Councillor Summers and then Councillor Stark. Uh, thank you, Councillor Davis. I know you're leaving, but thank you for that. I just gonna ask a question I have is can we build into the build flexibility into the contract? Um, I know it's something we need to be looking at in social service, for example, with IT changing so much. You need to have these things built into contracts nowadays, so we're ready for change. Um, because it does change quite fast and it's changing faster now than ever did. I think it's almost uh, once every six months there's a major change in, in the world. So we need to make sure we have flexibility in those contracts. Thank you. And I think that that point's been taken on board. Councillor Stark. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's not just a case of having targets with a, a contract. We have, we have to manage that contract in terms of performance. And we've not always been good at that in the past. And not only that, we should be prepared to have penalties in the contract if that performance is not up to scratch. Now, I'm thinking here around the uh, landfill issue where we've got a 22% current position and we want to get it down to 1%. But well, we need to make sure that whoever we actually employ under this contract actually delivers that. There's no point just having the target. We really do need to make sure that if they don't deliver that there are proper sanctions in that contract that they will suffer if they don't deliver it. And I'm just concerned that we can have targets, but we may not have the means by which we can hold the contract to, to those targets. That's something we can take on board as well. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Councillor Sark, that's an excellent point. And it's all about contract management, but um, please don't mention the word penalties again. Um, <laughs> sad memories. <laughs> Sorry, Chair, um, we didn't even get to that stage. 
Okay, right. Are there any uh, more questions or points that you wish to raise uh, about the waste management strategy and the responses? Um, as I said, we've, put, we've uh, made some extra add-on recommendations that uh, have been noted down, um, but I think we'll go through those after we've uh, addressed the next section of the, of the meeting. Um, so thank you for that. We can always come back at the last minute if we think we've forgotten something. So we now move on to the uh, executive response uh, to the climate and ecological emergency. And we have Councillor Chance here as the Cabinet Member for Environment here to answer any questions. Um, but before we go on, Ben, we stopped you in your stride, but I think we've, we've, we've moved on to the next item on the agenda. Is this something you just wanted to make some comments on uh, with regard to the responses that, that have been made by the executive? Thank you, Chair. Um, so yes, so this one is similar to the last one. It's another appendix with another table of uh, recommendations and responses. Um, there are more in this one, so I don't know if you want me to go through them all in turn, or if you just want to pick the ones to run through. I think, again, almost all of them have been, uh, or, or one I think were accepted. I think it's just one at the end, which I'm referring to an article, article for suspension, you know, which was rejected at, at the end. Um, how do you want to do you want to take through one by one or do you want to just do it by well, there's quite a lot to get through but uh, do, just can i look to members do they have any point salient points that they want to focus on at this stage because the start yes chair um, i've got two recommendations that i propose to the committee that we need to see they're both on recommendation two and the last recommendation recommendation 11 so i want to concentrate on those two thank you chair Okay, any other committee member wish to, at this stage, raise any specific point? Because obviously if we go through every single point of recommendation, we could be here quite a while. Councillor Chalice, did you want to make any points at this stage? Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, committee members. I'm also really glad to be able to be here just to um, talk about this and answer any questions you might have. Um, uh, as Ben says, um, they've all been accepted except the, the last one, and um, I'm particularly um, pleased about recommendation two, the establishment of a standing panel, and I'm, um, you know, really positive about the fact that the Rethinking Governance Working Groups appear, appears to be moving towards um, recommending a structure which will give us much greater kind of scrutiny attention on environmental issues, so um, this standing panel is definitely a first step towards that, and I really look forward to to working um, with them. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just leave it there. Very happy to answer any questions, but I suppose I would just like to say I'm really, really grateful, um, not just to the task and finish group that spent so much time and energy last year coming up with the original report, but also the kind of, you know, the, the energy and engagement from members that has resulted in asking of additional questions, um, that this report is now responding to. I think it's fantastic that, um, you know, climate and ecological issues are having so much attention um, from various directions in the council and it's really helpful to have that some scrutiny too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, Councillor Stark, that's the floor. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the efforts that have been put in by officers and the cabinet in answering the 15 recommendations that we came up with. We could have come up with a lot more. This is this is such a huge, huge area. And it is a pressing area. But if we just think about the apocalyptic events that are happening around the world as we speak, record breaking temperatures in Canada and North America. Unprecedented floods in Central Europe, a really depressing drought in Iran, which is sending a lot of vulnerable people there. Um, so, my sort of responses today to these further recommendations is around this issue about are we actually doing enough to actually counter climate and ecological change? And as part of the standing panel, we have met. I think the feeling is that we're not doing enough, that we're not seeing the press and immediacy and the profound challenges that are facing us of this 
that time is moving on and that we do seem to get embroiled in process and in constitutional issues. And to be frank, Chair, climate and ecological change doesn't comply with our constitution, doesn't comply with the planning regulations, doesn't comply with any rules that we might want to bring up that may stop us taking action here. And so I really just want to leave that message there with everyone that we really do need to consider whether we're moving fast and deep enough in what we are doing on response to our climate and ecological emergency. In that respect, my two proposals today um, should be seen in that light, Councillor Charles. I don't think it's sufficient for a standing panel to be sitting at the bottom of the pile when it comes to scrutiny. Even under the rethinking governance structure, we have a three-tier layer with a strategic management board at the top, four scrutiny committees in the middle, including one on environment and sustainability, and then you have standing panels at the bottom. I think that's just not sufficient to, to actually move us fast enough on this particular topic. So what, what I want to propose today, and I have already drafted, Chair, a recommendation for consideration, is that we want the standard panel not to be reporting into the scrutiny structure, but to be reporting directly to the executive itself. We think you need help here. We think this is such a big and, and dramatic issue for all of us that to leave it to one or two cabinet members and a few officers is just simply not enough. We need to try and marshal what resources we can from the councillors that we have amongst us. So my first proposal will be around that standing panel of five councillors actually reporting directly to the executive office and not simply being part of the scrutiny structure. My second proposal, Chair, is around recommendation 11. The standing panel members just do not think that can, this can be left as it is. It's not sufficient to use the plan and regulations to say that we can do nothing about destructive activities that are impacting on the environment and the ecology of Herbertshire every day. Destructive activities such as water sports off roads. And it's not just water sports, destructive activities such as permitted development, which is not sustainable or compatible with what we want to happen as part of our CEE. So under recommendation 11, I have a further proposal, Chair, and that is that the Chair of the Council should write to the Secretary of State for Community Housing and Local Government and ask for, and for the potential for Herbertshire to introduce an Article 4 direction that covers the whole of Herbertshire LPA so that we can actually do something practical in terms of our CEE, in terms of stopping the destructive activities that are happening across Herbertshire that we do not seem to have any control over. So that's the two proposals I have on the table today. Councillor Wilden is also part of the standard panel, and if he wants to add to it, then, then that's fine. But I really do think we really do need to wake up and smell the coffee here. And that's my that's my two proposals on the table. Thank you, Councillor Stark. Um, Councillor Wilden, you have been Scrutiny Committee met last week to discuss the, uh, the work programme, which will come on in the next item. And I think with regards to your first recommendation, we pretty much thrashed that out and all happy to support that approach, uh, especially because of the, 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 the involved work of the standing panel. So um, better to capture that energy and keep, keep on going with that. The other recommendation too, um, I, I can't support that, and it's I think because it's just the way the respect it's worded. Because permitted development and Article Four directions don't work that way. 
you have to nominate which rights that you want to take away. And you have to make an application for those individual rights. So it might involve motorcycle cross or something like that. You can't have a blanket request. You have to nominate which rights you want to withdraw. That is part of a process, not writing to the government minister to say, can we do this? So I think, and I've spoken in the past, I think we should definitely explore Article 4 directions if we think that we are preventing environmental harm. So don't get me wrong, I'm in support of the idea, but I'm not in support of the way this is worded because I don't think you write to the government minister. You start an Article 4 process and then you do consultation on which rights you wish to remove. Then once you've gone all through those processes, then there's a formal application to the government minister, uh, and then that's approved so long as you've gone through all of the right things. So this reads like a blanket ban, but not specific about what it is you want to address. I think work needs to be done on which committee development rights we think, or the council thinks, or the standing panel thinks are harmful to the environment, and then engage with the planning team to say, these are the Article 4 directions we think should be imposed in Herefordshire for the sake of protecting the environment. That's the way we should go. So I'm not in, against the principle, it's just the way it's been set out as the second proposal. Councillor Wally. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I basically support everything uh, Councillor Stark said, uh, especially the first uh, proposal. I take what you're saying about the second proposal. I think that's something we'll have to take into the standing panel and explore in more, more depth. But the main uh, point that uh, Councillor Stark put on the table of having the standing panel reporting direct uh, to the cabinet, I think, is something I absolutely support. Um, and I'm sure the other members of the standing panel would as well. Um, I just wanted to add one other little thing, and this is my bugbear, it's been for some time, about the council's website not having, not taking, not appearing to take um, the climate emergency uh, in any way seriously by not having proper links on it to all the great pages that have been created recently. And what I'd like to add as a, um, a recommendation is that as soon as possible, there is on the scrolling banner, a section which talks about the climate and ecological emergency and links to the pages. That there, at the moment, I think there are three rolling panels, a couple of them on COVID, one on talk community. I don't see why there can't be one, a fourth one, um, talking about the climate and ecological emergency. Uh, without that, how can you uh, say to people we're taking behaviour change as the main thing that we're trying to get across to people? How can you pretend that you're addressing that when on your own website, you don't even acknowledge that there's a problem. So that, I'd like to see that. Okay, Councillor Stark. I never want to accept that we can't change our procedures and processes. Um, I take your point, Chair, insofar as you may be right as regards the detail of the procedure that I'm asking for. But what I was trying to get at, maybe I failed to get on the proposal, was to actually go to the minister to change it, to allow councils, if not through this particular instrument, to have more control over what activities actually takes place across their LPAs. Now, perhaps Article 4 may not be the right way to go forward because of the constraints you see are there already, but I'm talking about destructive activities that are happening now. I mean, we see what's happening to our ecology out there. And, and it's a crying shame. And if the instruments are in place that allows us to actually control those in a way that they need to be controlled, then perhaps we should be still having that debate with ministers about what we need as an LPA in order to have people 
Yeah, yes, I understand the point. I think if you wrote to a government minister, they said there is the opportunity and it's called the Article 4 process. So there is the mechanism to stop activities that you think are harmful or require them to be controlled inside the planning system rather than the automatic committed development system. The mechanisms are all there. So I think your letter will, to the government minister will just receive a response that says, yeah, the mechanisms are there. It's just the council's will to ensure that they use those mechanisms to bring about what you're concerned about. Well, perhaps we can change the recommendation along those lines. I don't want to lose the point. No, no, no. I, 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 because I may have not quite got it right in terms of planning yeah. the terms, but I do want to still have the point of planning as a proposal. Yes, and, and to the, I mean, I'm no expert by any means, but through the Article 4 process, you make your case as to why you want these right automatic rights withdrawn so that they are controlled by the planning process rather than just automatically happen. And there's obviously a consultation process there because you're proposing to take away automatic rights that the government framework has set out. But so long as you argue your case and put it forward, what you're effectively doing is then bringing it into the planning system so that you can control it with all of the environmental caveats and concerns that you've got. But it's the mechanism is there. It's just the council as a corporate body having the will to carry that through on the things it decides are it wants to control more. And I think the work perhaps at the standing panel, and even if it comes back to scrutiny, is to try and figure out what permitted development rights should be targeted. So does it mean that, um, you know, I'd be happy to support an amendment to the, to, to the, to, to the second proposal, which said, and the standing panel or the, the, the council investigates and draws up a list of those permitted development rights that it should seek to get Article 4 direction control over so that it can help protect the environment. Councillor Summers. I would agree with that, Chair. Um, you have to be really careful with this overarching controlling thing that we're, that we're looking at in this second part. Uh, the mechanisms are there. Um, you read through them, there's all kinds of rules and regulations the public bodies enforcement. Uh, we don't have sufficient enforcement. They're, they have to take priorities first of what's going to cause damage to, um, to people's lives rather than just the environment. I know the environment's a big thing, but we need to look at more enforcement and having those enforced offers to perhaps train in what is out there that we need to be doing rather than so I think some of them are mostly looking at planning uh, planning things rather you know is it uh, are they doing the planning right are they doing the building right etc cetera, etc cetera. so environment enforcement is is pretty short staffed and uh, we need to bump that up before we go put anything in rules and regulations but it, you're some good thoughts there, but it is overarching, and I'm a little concerned that we're being too heavy handed and we need to give our, our, our officers a little more uh, flexibility in what they're doing, and also that we need to take some of the pain from them because they have to do quite a bit of work for the amount that we have. Thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't put the. Didn't have that on. No, no, but the, but the point is enforcement is a natural consequence of restricting. Permitted development rights. Right. Do we have any further comments? Comments from officers? Um, ben. Uh, just a quick one from myself. Um, thank you, Councillor. Uh, start the mentioning before meeting with you. I think so. Um, I did have a quick conversation with, with Kevin Bishop, our um, development manager, and he was advising me that the, the recent government advice is very much against uh, the blanket and it's very much around targeted responses. So that, that's the mm -hmm. government's increasing direction. So I suppose it's just a big agree for them, make for them where they're needed. It's about making sure that we do them on top specific and, and that, that's the process that's there. So um completely you know agree with the principle. It's just that's the mechanism that I don't think will, will change the government that recently announced that, that sort of guidance. So it's um pardon me the uh, moment comment really that's the start. I've always been on for outcomes chair. 
not to be driven by process or regulations. And always be challenging in it. I can quite understand that the feeling around the group is not for a blank approach here. So I'll leave it to the leader whether he does want to raise these sorts of issues with ministers because does the leader and the executive think they've got enough control of what's happening to the county in terms of environmental and ecological damage? Because at the end of the day, this is what I'm trying to stop. This is what I'm trying to achieve. And outcomes is what we should be about here. And we so often get driven into talk about process. And process is all very well, but if we don't actually aid what we're trying to achieve, then we should be changed. But I do see the mood round the table. Yeah. It is not to be all this proposal as it now stands. Well, no, no, I just make one point before Councillor Charles comes in, and then obviously Councillor Hitchin, you've been invited to speak, so please contribute to the meeting if you wish. Um, with process, because of the de permitted development system, members of the public landowners have rights. So you have to have a process if those rights are to change. So the process is consultation that's really important because what you're doing is you're challenging those rights that have been given by statute. So that's why there's a process involved in there. And I think it's really important to realise that. Uh, Councillor Chowns, would you like to come in? Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for this conversation. Um, it's really interesting to listen to. Um, I, I, you know, I really agree with uh, with with you, Louis, Councillor Stark. You know, we're we're interested in outcomes and in environmental protection. Um, with regard to Article Four, I think the executive response does set out very clearly why it's not possible to just have a kind of blanket ban of you know lifting of permitted development rights for you know anything that people might think might be harmful. Um, and I think that, you know, it's it, it's important not to, you know, no layer of government wants to issue that sort of blanket ban. The question is um, really how easy is it to run an Article 4 process when there is a problem? Now, with regard to kind of motocross, I, I personally wouldn't classify it as the, you know, the, the, the most, the biggest environmental damage problem that we've got in the county as a whole. It's very specifically targeted in specific areas. And it's also particularly um, although it does clearly have environmentally damaging effects, it's particularly damaging in terms of the social effects on the, the people in the vicinity. Um, I, I don't know if members are all aware, but the council has now issued one Article 4 direction um, a couple of months ago, and it is uh, for a site in my ward, so I've become quite familiar with the process. I would agree that um, it would be good to make the process easier, and it would also be helpful if government didn't say, you know, in the middle of COVID, you can have 28 days permitted development rights rather than for 14. Um, but in kind of taking this matter forward, I think, um, Councillor Lester, you made a suggestion regarding the council identifying the issues that are of particular concern and perhaps the locations that are of particular concern and assessing the potential for using Article 4 directions in those specific areas to address those specific problems. I think that would be a good way forward. Um, and perhaps the committee might also want to consider making a recommendation around looking at how other authorities have addressed these types of problems, because I'm sure that we could learn from um, good practice elsewhere. Um, I could comment on standing panel and comms, but happy to do that later. Please do so now if you wish to Seeing as you have the floor, if you wish to comment now, please do so. Uh, yes, I think if I, if I may, uh, Chairman, um, uh, writing letters to, to ministers have mixed, uh, mixed effects. Uh, sometimes it takes them a couple of months to reply to, to uh, the things I, I write. Uh, the one exception has been the letter I wrote um, helped a lot by the officers in connection with the phosphates. Uh, that has really caught the imagination of, of a lot of people. Um, and I think that's partly because our, our own MPs are, are very hot on this and also has an economic impact. So, so I think that's, that's an example of where <clears throat> we're writing a letter has actually produced something uh, positive. So we can learn perhaps as a council uh, how, to, how to use uh, our communication and lobbying uh, more effectively. So 
Um, the, the other thing is about, about this particular issue is that I don't have an enormous amount of information or knowledge about regulation for. Uh, I, I, I rely on Ellie and, and others to, uh, to help me with that. But um, and I'm, I'm, I'm all for raise, trying to raise the profile of these issues if we, if we possibly can and uh, do it effectively. So maybe Councillor Chance and I will just have a chat and work out whether we, whether we should be writing a, an appropriate letter and we can take that separately. We, we don't have to rely upon a, a recommendation from, from uh, uh, this committee. We can, we can go and do it ourselves without that. So uh, hopefully that's of some help. Thank you, Councillor Hitchener. Uh, if we just go back to the, the second recommendation, which I think the first recommendation we're all in favour of and happy to support that one. So as I say, the, the, the challenge I have back is just to reword that <laughs> recommendation so that it's the committee think that the use of Article 4 direction should be explored more fully and work needs to be done on identifying which permitted development rights should be removed by Article 4 direction, something like that. Councillor Stark and then Councillor Summers. You don't think there's, a, there's some value asking the executive to raise this issue with, with ministers in terms of where that? And I do, I, I do hear what, what, what you say, Ben, about the national direction at the moment. But to have that debate about whether the, the actual instruments that are at our disposal are sufficient for us to be able to, to control this destructive set of activities. So I would suggest that there's two issues. There is, should there be a change to the permitted development document? That probably would be a letter to government to say, at the moment, this is too permissive, so it allows for certain things that can be harmful. So that is probably appropriately a letter to government to say, you should review the GPDO, because, sorry, the General Permitted Development Order, just a statutory document that allows for certain things. Uh, so perhaps that's the letter that a political letter that council could write to government. And then the issue about Article 4, the mechanisms are already there. It's just a matter of whether the council wants to pursue those. So I think there's two perhaps. So really, perhaps splitting the sentiments of your motion into two separate parts. Um, you know, the, Committee's concerned that the GPDO is too permissive so that it allows for certain harmful act, um, activities in the environment. And then the second one is, and the committee thinks that the council should explore which activities should be curtailed or controlled by an Article 4 direction. Would you be happy with that? Right, uh, Councillor Summers and then Councillor uh, Bowen. Ideally, it would be great if you want a lobbyist working in the council. And I know that I have a few friends in Canada, but this is Gurkha City, but if you have a lobbyist, and they're all very high to pay. Um, do we make enough use of the LGA? Uh, they have a bigger voice than we would at, 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 at Westminster. And it might be worth also writing to the head of the LGA to see what they would do for us. Uh, they do put things on their program, and maybe if they think enough of it, they will take it further. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Other recommendations, Councillor Lloyd. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Summers' recommendation that we should speak to the LGA is very sound and could be corrected, and we should take it up straight away, I think. Uh, also, as far as enforcement goes, I fear that our enforcement team is overworked and has been proved to be very feeble in many instances. I'm sorry to be rude about them, but they have not always performed to the benefit of the people that are serving up break. And perhaps we should do some sort of review of that, I don't know. But we're planning generally. But certainly in the, in the enforcement has been the Achilles heel in the planning department. And it is very, very sad to say that. It's very unsatisfactory at the moment, I think. Mean. And it's, they are overwhelmed, I think, with work. Um, and we should be doing something about that. Thank you. Can I just say, Councillor Bowen, it, it's on the work programme to have a review of planning in due course. 
Um, so maybe that's a topic to be picked up there. I'd be very happy to be involved in that. Thank you. Okay, so but focusing on this aspect, because I, I really want to capture the sentiment of what's being proposed, but it looks as though having given it further discussion, it's just trying to ensure that we encapsulate the sentiments of Councillor Stark's point whilst dealing with the practicalities of the process of Article 4 direction. So um, I look to Councillor Stark. Well, I'm quite happy that we can start by writing to the LGA. I mean, I agree with Councillor Sullivan, I have suggested that in the past. And it is an association part we don't use enough. But I would like to keep in the back pocket that we go to the list of companies in the well, well, following your line of, uh, following your approach, what I would re recommend is could ask the executive to write to government about the permitted development system and be concerned that it may be too permissive in terms of certain environmental practices. Um, write to the LGA for their support in that, and then get this council to actively pursue which article four topics they think they should progress. Because the, the, the main task is to pursue which article fours and where this council should be look, investigating to see if it's possible to do them, to address perceived harm. So I don't want to lose that initiative. And I think that should be part of your recommendation that, that you identify where and what are practices and that through the standing panel, through the standing panel um, happy for scrutiny to help with that but let's identify them forward and then we can check and i mean councillor Jones has already said that she's being familiar with the process of article four because there's one going through in her ward so you know i think that's something that should be done now um rather than wait for letters responses to letters Councillor Summers. Thank you. I will agree that it does take a while sometimes to get an article for sorted, but by experience, it, it, it can be done. I know um, in, in my patch, we had a situation where somebody changed the land. They were going to build a racetrack. It took two years, but we finally got it stopped and the best of it back the way it was. But it is a long fight, and we don't have the staff to do that kind of fight. And that's what we need quite often. You know, we need somebody to take it by the whatever you want to call it, and go after it. And we did it this time, but it doesn't always happen that way, right? Because it is a lot of work with, with the system at the moment. So maybe making it easier to do it would, would be better. But yeah, it, it has happened here. We we, we won a case and uh, you know now we're fighting to make sure that it's put back the way it was, but it is possible. Thank you. Right, so um, can I ask Ben, is, have we got some guidance on how we can try and amend the second point uh, so that we encapsulate all of the points that have been made? Yeah, shall I share my screen? I'm just going to yeah. give you other Yes, yes, we might as well if there's no other points that we wish to be on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, indeed, just give you a okay. um, Come up here, don't they? Don't they? Don't they? Sorry, Chair, I'm, I'm struggling to, uh, to share them at the start. Oh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, should we just do this point first? Just to nail that yep. down, Shri. Yep. Um, so, so in, in terms of um, Kenton Stark's uh, initial comment was that general scrutiny uh, committee believes they haven't signed up to our climate ecological emergency. That further action needs to be taken across Heritage to stop activities that are further damaging uh, our environment and ecology. And recommends, I'm um, suggesting that that the, the executive be invited to explore more fully those permitted development rights which could be subject to Article Four Directive. 
action. And, and the executive encouraged the right to government and local government association to identify concerns about the general permitted development order in terms of the ability to stop or control activities that are harmful to the environment and ecology. Thank you, Chair. Picking up on Councillor Summer's point, it's about flexibility, isn't it? It's about the time it takes and the ability to actually enforce it. So I, mean, I don't know where they need to capture that at this yes. stage, but that is, that is the point you raised, Councillor Summer. I should point out that it, it is a lengthy process at the moment. Uh, it has to go through legal channels. They can't just say, close it down, can't march in and close it down immediately. So yeah, there is a lot of work to do in that area. But a lot of it, as I just mentioned before, has to do with the ward council. That depends on how much the ward council wants to fight on some of these things to prevent this happening when he hears about it. So this is another thing that we have to tie in. It has to do with people on the ground, the parish councils and the ward council. And, and it does take a lot, a lot out of you sometimes. Thanks. I, I think that we have to be make a difference between enforcement action yeah. and going for an Article 4 direction. And they're two different things. So just to be clear, that they're not the same. So, um, but I, I think the, the point about the letter to government is to say, you know, should the general committed development order be reviewed in terms of the potential environmental hazards that some of these permitted activities uh, can make. So I think that's the, the letter to government. Um, but whether or not the Article 4 process is flexible enough and gets the job done quick enough, uh, I think that's probably um, I think, well, yeah, I'm not quite sure if we would want to try and dismantle the whole <laughs> procedure. Um, uh, but you know, I, I think what's absolutely key here is to uh, make sure that this council is focusing on what it thinks should be in those Article 4 directions. And I think there's a general point coming out of this debate that we've had both in the TNF and also in the standard panel, which is how fit a purpose planning system is for dealing with the CEE. I mean, this is just a microcosm of it in a way, and it's only part of it. But at some stage, somewhere, we have to have that debate. I know we, you said in the work program, we're going to review the planning system, but this is another dimension of it. It's how quick the purpose is it to tell the planning to do what we want to do, and have not signed up to the CEE. And I think that's a point I would like to lose in the future. No, but I think it's something that the standing panel has really got to grapple with. Um, because, yeah, it's, it's one thing about debating about process, but it's the global issue of dealing with planning and how it copes with the challenges of all kinds of issues is, is, it, is a debate that's ongoing and will ongo, but be ongoing. But I think it's certainly something that the, the panel should, should be putting at the forefront of their uh, of their discussions because it's planning is the, is the one key mechanism that shapes what happens in our environment. Right, so our, what I'm concerned of is, Councillor Stark, are you happy with the wording that we're amending what we're proposing? Yeah, I'm happy, but I would like to see the draft letter, please. Well, the, the draft letter from the leader of the council to government. Well, there's a request, Councillor Hitchner, um, and I think that's duly noted. Right. So we're we ha happy because we've got those two recommendations locked down now. And the, 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 the third recommendation is, sorry, the second recommendation is now in three parts, is it not? Yes, indeed, sorry, in terms of the maximum yeah. now it's considered. Yeah. No, 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 um, the, the second one is we're writing, asking the executive to write to government about the Mr. Development, writing to the, uh, the local the LGA about the same issue, but also programming in that the, the council looks at which Article 4 issues are to be looked at now, and that's not reliant on waiting for answers from correspondents. So that's turning the one point that was made in this second recommendation into three points. Yep, so everyone's happy with that. So we've got those two recommendations. 
as a result of the uh, second item that we've been discussing. But of course, during the waste management discussion, we've put forward other recommendations. Um, so better to go to those and run through those, please. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the waste management issue, uh, we did consider additional communication, such as visual guides on waste bins, to have residents to understand the different waste types that can be recycled and how to clean separate materials. Uh, and next one, that the executive encouraged to review the booking system based on recycling centres to enhance flexibility and access for service users. Three, that the executive be asked to explore options. So the of flexibility of use by the public. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, the, so three, that we tested to be asked to explore options for the treatment of household waste uh, arising from small holiday lab businesses. Councillor Summers. Thanks. Uh, just on, on back to the bin, just a sec. One of the problems, especially with COVID, with COVID has shown us is the cleanliness of the bins. I know I go out in the bin and it's quite smelling. So I put some, some disinfectant in it, but I think it's something we need to be following up on or recommending. That especially the ones that go to sites is that uh, you just take your bins occasionally because they do get quite runny. Anyway, that's just a so it, it has nothing to do with this, but it has to do with moving waste. Anyway, maybe all together. Thanks. Mr. Boswell. Mr. Boswell. Sorry, I should have come in on uh, that previous thing. I think you said uh, the treatment of domestic waste from. Uh, I think it's important that we can't call it domestic waste, we have to call it commercial waste because it is illegally classified as, legal, as commercial waste. Uh, I'm not being pedantic, it's that, that's why we have to have the duty over there. So I think it's important to capture that. Uh, actually, so it's the treatment of waste from that, but look, clearly it's uh, exploring the options, not recommending a particular course of action at this stage. Um, and, and four, that the executive uh, be encouraged to examine how contracts can remain commercially viable, but with sufficient flexibility to enable adaptation to change in circumstances. Yep. Uh, and then there was one final one, if I may, in terms of the uh, the CE response, which was just Council Wilkins' point, um, which was regarding that, uh, that the, the uh, prominence of the uh, kind of ecological emergency um, on the Council web page is such a homepage banner um, uh, being approved. Okay, and Councillor Stark. Um, thanks for that, Ben. And um, there's another one. Uh, in drawing up the unified waste strategy, I asked the executive to put residents and small businesses at the heart of it. I think that, that's a very important sentiment to get across, and we shouldn't lose that. Because it shouldn't be done just because it might suit us or suit the contractors. It should be done in a way that enables facilitation. I think you're absolutely right, Councillor Stark, because at the end of the day, it's the taxpayers of Herefordshire that are the ones who are in charge ultimately, and uh, they're the ones we try to provide services for, and so those are the ones who really need to be put at the heart of it. Absolutely. Um, Councillor Summers. It seems to me that there were rules put in for Airbnb and stuff like that. But I'm not sure it has to do with waste, but in other areas, which made it easier for them to get on. So I can't see why we can't put something in there, um, suggesting that we combine. And, and if it's living in a private residence, and that's what came up with the Airbnb, that it was, it was more flexible. I'm not sure how it was exactly, but it's something we should be looking at, perhaps. I would question if the Airbnb would be commercial waste and we have to have the commercial waste arrangements for that. No, I, think, I think that would be something that you need to consider. Yeah, but from what I heard today, that's what's been happening. There is a difference between... Yes, there, there is a difference between Airbnb, I think, and holiday accommodation. Okay, sure. is, because holiday accommodation units that are specifically let for that are business rated, whereas Airbnb is just is just covered due to practice by you know using somebody else's house that's got council tax on it. Okay. Council Wildly. Um yeah, I'll come back to that point just in a second. I just wanted to go into what Ben read out for that recommendation I was making about the 
counter website. Um, I can't remember exactly what you said now, Ben, but something like, could it be improved? And I think what we want to, what I personally like to see recommended is that a banner talking about climate and ecological emergency with a link to the pages is permanently displayed as part of one of the rolling banners. That's it. Okay. Um, and, and, then, and then finally, sorry, I did think that um, um, uh, intention that came to start to uh, uh, launch is regarding the standard panel, which I think is key for the SQ1, obviously. Um, it came to start its um, uh, recommendation was that given present current challenges facing potential climate and ecological change to CEE, um, the executive agency considered setting up the CEE standing advisory panel, directly advising and supporting them, ensuring that the executive deliver our commitments against the CEE. CEE. That the CEE standing advisory panel be responsible for keeping the correct street committee abreast of progress and thus enabling the executive to be held to account for progress on the CEE. Excellent. Um, you, ben, you wanted to come in on Airbnb, I think, was it? Um, yeah, I didn't mean to try to. I was just going to say, I think we just need to double check for the idea of BNB waste as uh, being how so that I'm not sure I think it would be commercialised, but I mean, I'll get into detail with that again. Yes, Councillor Wilding, you've been back on, on that point. Of light on it. Yeah, I, it is a question of how it's described, isn't it? It's commercial, it's called commercial waste because it's coming from a property that's paying a business rates. But the actual waste itself is, I mean, for instance, on the recycling side of it, what's it going to be? It's going to be a wine bottle that someone has drunk and put in the recycling. And that's exactly, exactly the same. I'm not saying we're alcoholics. <laughs> but it's exactly what we might put in our recycling. And then in terms of the waste, again, I cited, I'm trying to think, an eggshell until we get the food waste as well, uh, an eggshell or a piece of cling film that can't be recycled, maybe put in at ours, it's exactly the same waste. We're not talking about, I mean, if they were running some kind of small printing business in the thing and there was like reams of paper with your ink all over it, that'd be a totally different type of waste, wouldn't it? But we're talking about waste that is exactly the same as household waste. Um, the only point is that it's been classified as trade because it's there's a, a trade operating, but that trade is not creating trade waste, it's creating household waste. And to separate it off and to put it in another bin, is only creating more waste. Yes. And, and I suppose the phrase you could use is indistinguishable between the two. Yeah. And so therefore, what's the difference? And I, I think about the planning terms that are used where you're trying to describe the material change of use. If, if there's no indistinguishable use between the two, then nothing is occurring differently. So. I, I would have thought when you apply for this uh, duty of care, license and you're prepared to pay say a hundred pound a year a little bit more than the 87 that's paid at the moment um it's a it's a win-win because the council doesn't have to buy the plastic sacks they don't have to be transported they don't have to be disposed of and the business is paying a little bit more but it all makes everything so much easier okay so i, I just encourage you to look at how that could be done yeah. Okay, which is in our recommendation. Yeah. Right. Uh, are there any other key burning issues that we want to add? Um, oh, once again, we're taking several attempts at uh, tackling these issues, and I think this is that's the good way forward because every time we have a meeting, we come up with another thing that is worth pursuing. Um, so I think it is really worth revisiting these issues and hammering them out in the, in the meetings that we've done. And uh, before I forget, I would just like to say a big thank you to both of the Task and Finish groups for their work. It wasn't just a five minute thing. It was a lot of dedication over long months. Uh, so thank you to them, uh, which has helped us to get to these situations we are right now. So without further ado, if there are no other um, recommendations,
recommendations we wish to add. Uh, we've gone through them all. We're all happy with them, I take it. So uh, we, I'll propose that we accept those recommendations as discussed. All in favour? Yep. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for to officers and uh, cabinet uh, for your participations on that particular item. Ben. Thank you, Chair. I just want to ask a, a clarification question just in terms of process. So um, these um, additional recommendations and we'll bring back a second, a uh, third executive response on both of these to a subsequent one. Are these recommendations you'd like to speak about to the spending plan? Uh, well, I, I think most of the issues that we talked about were, were the ones we were wanting the standing panel to run with. What does the rest of the committee feel? Well, the the first recommendation that Councillor Stark made about the standing panel reporting directly to the executive board or cabinet will have to go to them. The others, I think. The, the other thing to remember is also if the constitutional arrangements go through in October, you will have another scrutiny committee that's specifically looking at environmental mm. uh, issues. And so it will be for them to, I presume, look at the executive response that we've had from these recommendations. Yes, Chair, if, if I can suggest perhaps saying, often normally we take executive. Um, recommendations that would come back through the work program and be added to the, the list of uh, recommendations and responses. So perhaps could we focus on that as, as that's the way the format that it will come back rather than officers having to come back for another right. meeting. Yeah, that's when you save on the officer's resource. That's just yeah. 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 Okay, Councillor Stark. Um, Councillor Dean is meeting with the Race Group TNA tomorrow. It's probably the other the Race Perhaps then we should share our waste recommendations with our meeting. So we know what we want to do. Of course, I'll forward that to Kent Davis, though. If you can, I'll be sure we can work out to sign as well as chair of the waste team. Because I think it would be useful yes. for them to have that in front of them when they have the meeting tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great, great, great idea. Okay, then. So we Voted on all of those recommendations. Thank you to everyone participating. We now have the next item on the agenda, which is the work program. Um, sorry, thanks, thanks everyone. I'll leave you now. Okay, thank you, Councillor Chance. Thank you for your attendance. So the committee members met informally uh, via Zoom on uh, Monday, the uh, 12th of July, to discuss the work program. It was suggested that an additional meeting be held on Tuesday, the 10th of August 2021 to consider the Maylord Shopping Centre. The committee will recall that um, a member of the public suggested Maylord Orchard Shopping Centre is an item for scrutiny activity and it was added to the draft work programme in September 2020. Um, do uh, committee uh, members wish to request the item of Bale or Orchards goes to the August committee meeting. Yeah, uh, that was also raised in the tap audit and governance segment, Bale or Orchards. I asked a question at that time, I saw that that was where very hot breakdown of 172,000 pounds that was didn't get to council that was kept back for whatever reason. They do, but it's not going to ask on that. I'm not sure if it's anything to do with this or not. Is this just strictly all the governments? Uh, it's made on orchards, so that we need to be, you know, if we're going to look at made on this looks like there's two groups looking at made on orchards, audit governance and us. Well, uh, the, the point is noted. I mean, the, the question to the committee is do we want to discuss the matter on the uh, 10th of August? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, what I would suggest, Councillor Summers, is whatever question you ask, if um, you know. could, well, if you could just give officers, remind them oh, of the, the question and then give them a chance to answer. It's only actually this through the government's committee, so they said that that part of the time. Yeah, but they, 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 at that meeting, then they said they would let all the, all the members know what that, that breakdown was. And the chair asked the same question, and still we still have an answer on that. That was 
over 10 days ago. So anyway, it's nothing to do, but it's just something that may come up. By all means, ask the question, but if you've given up, you just prompt officers so that they're able to answer you at that meeting. Yeah, that, would, that, that would help. Um, so will we all agree to discuss May Lord Orchard on the 10th of August? Yeah. yeah. Chair, if I may, just, just in terms of obviously the time there, there's not much time between the, the obligation uh, date between the, this meeting and, and this August meeting. Are there any could, could officers identify, sorry, could members identify for officers if there are any particular aspects of the, the, the trip and centre acquisition or management or or uh, plans that, that you particularly want to cover? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I would suggest the whole project is um, retains its scrutiny. All, all aspects. It's very important. I think you can't just sing one bit of it. You need to look at the, at, at the whole thing in its entirety and where it, what, it, what its purpose is, where it's going, etc. Is, it, is it a viable and sensible project as well? Okay. Sorry. Uh, just, it's just a case that then really for, for, for members just consider whether or not it's timely to have a report quite soon to talk to us if it can be prepared in a sufficient fashion or, or whether or not you want to receive that to the later meeting in, in more depth. I thought that meeting was for the town hall, right? Well, the, the, we, we've been asked about Baylor Orchard. I know that the town hall was the first one on that list, I thought, and then Baylor Orchard is added as a... That's the next item we've got to agree. Yeah. So but I thought the town hall was, was, was the focus of that, and the Baylor Orchard, we could probably do, do without it. That one, but I think we need to look at the, the town the town hall because that's what's be causing all the. Well, we, we, we've set aside a meeting so that it can be called in, okay. Uh, and that's the meeting of the tent. But Councillor Stark, there were two reasons for including both items here. Systems one was that just in case the town hall before it was available today, it was still not. Substantial items to discuss the tent of August. And second is my point about the juxtaposition of both spending money on a commercial venture while at the same time you're willing to sell all the town hall. And that to do the two in isolation misses that connection and misses that chance for us as a committee to tease it out. Now, I'm not saying the decisions weren't taken in isolation anyway, but it's the it's the way it's perceived by residents as to how the two have come together with so much taxpayers' money being spent on the Mayor Doctor, but for some reason we need to sell off the town hall in order to, to actually um, create revenue that we would have had if we had spent on the Mayor Doctor. So I do think the two of them we do have a connection there for the committee at least to explore if nothing else. Yes, so there is virtue of having the two together. Um, uh, We've got uh, Neil Taylor. We'd like to come in at this point. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Councillor. Um, the uh, it's just a question of the scope of the uh, May Lords report. To be honest, um, if we are going to have a report that goes through everything from the purchase to the management to the current plans for it, that strikes me as a full meeting's worth and will also take a bit more time to put together than for the 10th of August. Um, I, I realise that you'd like to look at both the Town Hall and May Lodge at the same time, but the, it just seems to me like there, that there's, a, there's enough to get into a full meeting on both of them. And if we're going to do a proper job on the May Lodge report, uh, it would be helpful if we could do the Town Hall on the 10th and... Um, uh, May Lords uh, at a meeting after that, please. The thank you for that contribution. Um, the town hall hasn't been called in as a pre decision and can't be called in as a pre decision yet, can it? The decision hasn't been made. It's actually been made, it hasn't made, but could, the Prince could choose to, to, to undertake pre decision call in and, and, and resolve that at this meeting. So that that comes to the tent of August 18th. Yeah, yeah. So. Right. So, do we want to call in the issue of the town hall so that it's this committee that decides that it goes to the 8th, 10th of August rather than relying on mem other members who aren't members of this committee? 
Mr. Chairman, I think he's actually essentially recording this particular town hall. It's, it's an iconic building. It is such an important part. It also houses very important parts of Heritage Council's services. I really think he's calling in very, very strongly. Okay. Um, Councillor Wilding, Councillor Stark. Um, I'm happy with whatever the committee agrees. I mean, I do, I would prefer the two to be discussed together. But I do think there is that unfortunate presentation point. Um, why are we selling one branch, spending money on the other? But if we have to do a full job on May laws and have to take something, I have to just have to bring my stuff to the town decision with that. Okay, uh, Councillor Wilde. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to see them separated because I, I do agree with the officer saying they needed a, more time to get a full report. And I think there are significant differences between the buildings. I, I know they're both uh, important to the population, but we're talking about one building which is you know, built a long time ago, it was built to last, but because of that perhaps hasn't been given um, uh, enough uh, remedial treatments over the years because it seems to build, be built to last, whereas the other building um, is a building which is more modern and perhaps uh, has other options for the public. So I'd be happy to see them separated. Okay, I mean, logistically, uh, if we think. Uh, the meeting, Ben, the meeting is going to be in this room, I presume? Um, for the August meeting, um, it would depend potentially on, on potential attendance. It's you know, clearly well, we have some invitations to the room, but uh, if we can get as many people as possible to attend, to be attending virtually, other than the voting members of the committee being in the room, then it could be here. Um, alternatively, we could find another venue to accommodate more people if, if more ministers wish to be in the presence and attendance. Because I'm just, I'm just, I think Councillor Stark's point about the two issues being, uh, you know, connected in, the, in their outlook is a really important one. But the other thing I have a concern about is that if the one topic, so the town hall, is generates a lot of public interest and a lot of people wishing to attend, are we in danger of giving lots of time? To that one, and then running out of time to deal with May Lords so that we don't give the May Lord Orchard acquisition enough space to, uh, to, to, to debate that one. So I see the merits of having them both, and ideally would like them, but I'm just thinking logistically it might be unrealistic to achieve that. Um, and then if we have to discuss May Lord at a later time, it then gives officers more time to create a com more comprehensive report, which is, I think, the point that Neil Taylor's making. So um, it's a bit of a dilemma, but can I hear members' views, please? It was just, there was a discussion using the county hotel for the meeting so re residents could attend if necessary. Councillor Bowen. I, th I think, Mr. Chairman, the town hall will attract a lot of public interest, and you might get quite a lot of public trying to come in and see what's going on and possibly even have questions on the public in a fairly strong format, I would suggest. And I think we should be prepared for a very thorough meeting on the town hall on the one day and do it properly. And the mail was orchard, yes, we should do it very thoroughly and properly, but if we do it more thoroughly and more properly, we have complete report for us and everything in place for that one particular meeting too. And we can also talk about its relationship with the government on financial matters and the policy. That's our duty, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, then. So I think the mood of the meeting is that whilst it's important to discuss both and they are in some way connected, probably just due to the logistics, it would be best to just have the town hall meeting on the 10th of August. And that's something we can determine now to call in as this committee. So we're all happy with that position. I'll, I'll recommend that from the chair. Uh, is everybody in favor of that? Yeah. Okay then. So is it
it possible then that we So because what we've got on the 13th of September is the meeting to discuss the report on the, the uh, Hereford University and the report on the disposal of the Lacey School site. So it may be that we have another separate meeting to discuss the bailout. Added to that. It's about okay. disposals, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's about disposals, but we, you know the problem with um, the consequences of the decision we just made is that we, we, we will have a knock-on effect onto these two other issues. And I, I don't equally, I don't want to lose these either uh, in the work program before everything changes. So, could there be a, another meeting in September, Ben, about May Lord? I think given the August break, that, that might be a little bit tight. I mean. It, could we schedule something in October, perhaps? To, to well, then the, the meeting of full council to decide. I mean, it, it, it'll just have to get. What do members feel? Do they want to discuss the main or orchard one soon after? Because we could put back, we could move the uh, university item. And then we could have the next meeting on the 13th about disposal uh, of Home Lacey and Maywood. What can we do about Maywood? It's been deals gone through, from what I understand. What are we doing? What are we scrutinizing? Scrutinizing the process, whether it was best value, oh, whether, okay. the, whether, whether the, the right public monies have been spent appropriately, um, the committee's views on how the centre should be used. I mean, I'm putting words into your mouth, but yeah. you know, what would you it, think? No, but then it is almost a separate thing, isn't it? It's 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 a, it's already been disposed of, but we want to know if it's been all the T's across and all the I's and dotted. Whereas the disposal of the whole basically and other disposal, that's something that we have to look forward to. And that's going to cabinet fairly soon. I think it's uh, on this this twenty third, I think, or twenty second. So we'll have some some idea of what's happening with that. Sorry, yeah. at that time. So, so then my recommendation then would be on the twenty on the thirtieth thirteenth, sorry, of September, we discuss the uh, disposal of Emily and Bailey Orchard. Okay. Councillor Watt, uh, the thing you're suggesting there is that we shunt back. Um, N mine. Yes. Is it important that we keep N, N mine, you know, in the forefront? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm is it time to... sensitive in any way? Is what I'm asking. Uh, I look to Ben. Could you put some advice on that? Uh, I'm not aware of any, any particular pressures myself, but it's going to the work program sometimes come back. Uh, I'm not aware that it's arisen out of a sequence of decisions at the moment. So. Um, clearly, if, if that position is different, then, then I'm sure officers will, uh, will let me know. And yeah, that process. I guess I'm just feel that that to me is a very important thing, and I don't want it to get shunted away forever. But I'm happy for it to be put back if, if it makes no difference. Yeah, I think I think the, I think the, the issue with May Lord Orchard is that the original request came from member from a member of the public. And what I'm conscious of is that this scrutiny committee and the scrutiny function has to show that it can be responsive to input from members of the public. So whilst I think the progress of the university and are we doing enough to help them and all of that is really important, if we've been asked, this committee has been asked to scrutinise something mm -hmm. uh, from a member of the public, it can show our effectiveness in being responsive to members of the public's queries by responding to that request. Now, whether you put that in front of the NMIT or not is entirely at the discretion of this committee, but I just think it's an important point to make. I mean, I'd, I'd be wanting to discuss them all, but I know that we are so full of our recommendations and uh, debates that these meetings get jam-packed full of, of recommendations. So if we have any more than two items, we are really stretching the, 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 the time we've got to discuss these issues but I, I look to the committee I mean what, what does the committee want to do about it it's well because of COVID everybody was slowed down in the city centre there's, there's no students 
in for a while from what I can tell. Uh, they have they are going ahead with all of us with, with side on park. So there's going to be some money well, money spent in there, but there are going to be some improvements or some things things done in there very, very soon or they're very processed. So I don't know if you want to look at it as they're processing the bed, I don't know. Okay, so let's let's make a decision about the 13th of September. Mail order home lacing or mail order? I'll, I'll accept that, yeah. Ma mail order home lacing or mail order? Uh, anyway. It's just that we, we, we do not want to lose in that. No, 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 no just, just so not too, not too far, far off. Uh, 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 thank you. I should say, I was at the Home Lacing Parish Council meeting last week and they have drawn up papers to have Home Lacing School designated to the student building. Okay, do we need to vote on this or do I have all agreement that on the 13th that we're discussing May Lord and Home uh, Lacey disposal? Happy with that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then the um, NMI will be at the next available scrutiny meeting. Councillor Stark. Um, as has um, the Hempshire City Centre. Transport plan is scrutinized by this committee in the past. I don't remember scrutinizing it. I don't think it's even, even available when I was a chairman of the city committee. So, unless you've done it since the my departure, it probably hasn't happened, I think. Mean. It just seems to me that that has to be given out of consideration by scrutiny in the past, given the statement by the chief executive this week. Yes, uh, going up to to well. that's correct. Is there that will be referred to audit and governance, though, as well? Will it not? Officers, can I just check? Uh, I, don't know. I'm, 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 I don't know myself, but I know Mr. Taylor um, is aware of uh, yes. the, 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 the current <laughs> review being undertaken on that. Mr. Taylor, can we ask you for clarification on that point? Sorry, I can't hear very well. What was the point? Sorry. The question, the question was, um, is uh, the Hereford City Centre Transport package, is that going to audit and governance to be reviewed soon? Um, I think it's, go it's certainly going to uh, uh, Cabinet later this week, uh, and then there will be a swap uh, audit of what's happened to date on that transport package, uh, and I'm sure that that swap audit will then go to Audit and governance. Right. Thank you for that clarification. But in terms of the overall package, um, I don't think that's gone, or it, that's certainly not in the program for scrutiny. So if that's something that should be scrutinized, I, I would agree with you that it should be. Um, but I don't think there's going to be time enough before the constitutional changes. But I think once the constitutional changes are done, that's got to be an item for one of the new committees to deal with pretty urgently. Could, could we have that as a recommendation that happens to you in this committee? Yes, and I would support that. Yeah, yes, and I would support that. So Ben, could we just make a note of that? Yeah. Thank you. And so the next item is the next item is the And so then we have, lastly, we've got the, not lastly, sorry, we've got the, uh, litter review, the task and finish group, the cabinet member commissioning procurement and assets invited committee to undertake task and finish group on litter and uh, a draft scope of statement has been produced. Uh, the committee members are Councillor Bowes, Councillor Bowen, Councillor Summers, they put their names forward, um, and Sam, that Councillor Milne and Councillor Crow of Burt have also been put forward by their groups. That's certainly the true with Councillor Probert. And the Liberal Democrats are to identify uh, yet the representative. Can I ask Councillor Stark? Has anybody? I've not heard anything, but I haven't been on TNF CEE for over a year. Continue to stand with that. No, okay, that's understandable. Okay, I haven't heard anything from Councillor James. No. Okay, perhaps if we could clarify that point, then okay. uh, that, if, if you could, that, that would be really good. 
Obviously, we don't want to, you to miss out on the position on the task and finish. Um, and the committee uh, content to confirm the membership as. Uh, oh, sorry, is this committee content to confirm the membership? Obviously, identify um, with, with the membership that I've just read out and also with a Lib Dem uh, representative as well. Is this committee happy for that membership to be so comprised? No. Councillor Bowes has suggested that two representatives from the litter picking organisation should be co opted onto the task and finish group. Um, would committee members be content with that suggestion? Nothing co opted. I think it would be a great idea. Yeah. Um, not that I want to sway the meeting in any way, but uh, everyone happy with that? Yeah. Uh, ben, you wanted to come in. Yeah, sorry, sir. I mean, and which is that question? Is was that a specific speaking group or is that just uh, two representatives which represent the group? Just two representatives, and I think that would be up to the committee to nominate who they should be. Um, so we're all in favour of that. Um, so the the the. Can I draw committee members' attention to the draft uh, scoping uh, statement? It will be noted that this will not be included. Um, sorry, it will be noted that what will not be included is specific reference to dog fouling. Um, this is because it's uh, encapsulated by different legislation. Uh, so is everyone happy about that? I know it's a bit of a contentious issue, but again, we don't want we don't want the standing uh, top and finish group stumbling over legislation. Um, so we're happy with that. Again, it could be something that the task and finish group grapple with themselves, not dog fouling, but the issue of the dog fouling. Um, and if there's any issues there, then they can. Uh, of that and uh, this committee also needs to uh, confirm the chairperson of the task and finish group and uh, I would propose councillor Bowes for that. Do I have a second? second yeah. Everyone in favour? Right, excellent, thank you for that. And so finally um, just to agree that the work programme is amended as we've discussed and the uh, litter picking review uh, task and finish group is established with the agreement and the uh, recommendations that we've just set out there. Are we all in favour of those? Yeah. Chair, can I just confirm that that includes the pre decision calling of the, the 10 month decision? Yes. And to be aware, pre decision calling means that the can't call it again after the decision is made, but the, 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 the 10 month committee wants to look at that and provide feedback, obviously, to the government member in advance. Sure. So, sure. so we're all happy about that recommendation to bring the uh, town hall uh, sale to the 10th of August. Great, okay then, thank you, all in agreement with that. And with those recommendations and agreements, um, I confirm that the next meeting of the scrutiny committee is going to be the 10th of August, uh, the venue to be decided. So thank you all for your contributions today, either virtually or uh, physically in attendance. And uh, again, lots of important topics have been covered and uh, lots of important contributions have been made. So I thank you all for that. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I've sat on a few committees and I have to say, Chair, that you've done, you've done a very good job. Thank you very much. Well, that's very kind of Councillor Summers. Thank you. And uh, that's are all for today and can we just confirm that the live stream is now switched on? I'm not used to that. <laughs> what I suggest